All right, welcome to the online call Zimfim seminar. Today, we're excited to have Yue Huang from uh, UC San Diego. We'll talk about latent hierarchical causal discovery uh, with rank constraints. After that, we'll have a discussion by uh, Eric Kummerfeld. Um, questions today will be handled by Ying, so I'm handing over to her now. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, so please, as usual, submit your questions through the Q&A section. If you haven't used it before, it is just a button uh, at the bottom of the uh, Zoom window. And please do not submit your questions through the chat because the Q&A section makes, us easy, uh, makes it easier for us to track the questions. Uh, without further ado, uh, the stage is yours. Please feel free to get started. Yeah, let me share screen. So can you see my screen well? Great. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to my talk. In this talk, I will introduce our recent progress on identifying latent hierarchical causal structure with rank constraints. This is joint work with Charles Lowe, Feng Xie, Clark Limo, and Quan Zhang. We know that Many tasks in science and engineering require causal information. And the crucial step is to find out the causal structure and the causal, causal strengths among variables. Traditionally, randomized experiments are used to find out the causal relationships. But randomized experiments may be time and resource consuming and may even involve ethical issues. Alternatively, one can find causal relationships by analyzing observational data under appropriate constraints or assumptions, because observational data are usually much easier to obtain. And the classical causal discovery approaches usually only consider causal structure among the observed variables, and the most of them assume no latent confounders. However, in complex systems, it's usually hard to enum enumerate and measure all task-related variables. And the measured variables may not be the underlying causal variables, such as image pixels, and the case when there are measurement errors on the measured variables. So this motivates us to extend causal discovery to more general scenarios, where causal relationships among latent variables are also considered. So the organization of the talk will be as follows. I will first briefly review basic principles and classical approaches in learning causal relationships among observed variables. And then I will give a quick review of previous developments for causal discovery among the latent variables. And then next, I will introduce our pro uh, proposed approach latent hierarchical, hierarchical causal structure discovery with rank constraints, which can handle more general latent graphs. Let's first have a quick review on causal discovery among observed variables. It has been shown that under appropriate assumptions, we can draw a connection between causal structure and the statistical independence. So one can make use of conditional independence constraints to infer the causal structure. And one of the most well-known algorithms along this line is the PC algorithm. The PC algorithm identifies the causal graph up to the Markov equivalence class, where the causal skeleton and some causal directions can be identified, but not all the directions. Furthermore, one can leverage functional causal model-based approaches to identify all causal directions that are un undetermined with conditional independence constraints. Specifically, with certain constraints on the functional causal model, the estimated noise term will be independent of the predictors when fitting a regression function in the causal direction. But such independence doesn't hold when fitting a regression function in the reverse direction. So with such asymmetric independent noise, one can identify the causal direction between every pair of random variables. 
And another way is to use the independent change between causal modules to identify the causal structure. When factorizing the joint distribution according to the causal structure, the derived distribution modules will, be cha will change independently of each other. But such independent change usually doesn't hold in the reverse direction. So the independent change principle can also be used to identify the causal structure. And moreover, this independent change principle can imply that with the correct causal structure and factorizations, causal representations have the minimal number of changes can also be used to identify the causal structure. However, in some cases, measured variables may not be the underlying causal variables. For example, in questionnaire-based psychometric studies, the questions denoted by STI, CI, and DEPI here are measured variables, which reflect the underlying latent concepts, the stress, coping, and depression. Here, it's more reasonable to care about the causal relationships among these three latent concepts instead of those among the measured variables. Another example is that for image data, it doesn't make sense to directly treat pixel values as causal variables. So we want to learn the latent causal representations or concepts from measured high dimensional image pixels. Therefore, in these scenarios, from measured variables, we want to identify the latent causal variables and find the causal relationships among them. For causal discovery among latent variables, which is also called uh, causal representation learning in some, uh, in some literature, a widely used metric is tetrad condition, which was initially proposed by Sperman more than 100 years ago. I will introduce the main idea of tetrad condition based on the following two graphs. Well, X represents measured variables and R represents latent variables. Let's denote by, let's denote rho ij, the, co uh, the correlation coefficient between measured variables xi and xj. For this graph in the left, rho 1, 2 times rho 3, 4 doesn't equal to rho 2, 3 times rho 1, 4. But for the right graph, the equivalence holds in all combinations. So these conditions can be used to distinguish between the two graphs from measured variables alone. And notice that the tetra condition actually indicates the rank deficiency of two times two off diagonal cross covariance metrics of the uh, measured variables. Several algorithms have been developed based on the tetra condition including algorithms that are designed to identify latent graphs that satisfy the one-factor measurement model. The one-factor measurement model means that each measured variable has only one parent, and each latent variable has at least three measured ones as children. And there are also algorithms that are designed to identify the tree structures, where tree structure means that um, there, there's only one uh, undirected path for every pair of variables. And then recently, some developments make use of high order statistics for causal discovery among latent variables. And one example is the generalized independent noise condition, which ex extends the independent noise condition to the confounding case, with which to identify the latent, variable, uh, latent causal graph. And by leveraging non-Gaussianity, that is the high order statistics, all causal directions between the latent variables can be identified. However, previous methods for latent causal discovery usually have strong constraints on the latent causal structure, such as the, uh, the tree structure and the one factor, one factor measurement model. So next, I'm going to introduce our recent developments on latent causal structure discovery with rank constraints, which can handle more general scenarios. Specifically, 
we assume all variables, both measured ones and the latent ones, follow a linear functional causal model and allow a latent allow um, and allow a latent hierarchical structure. That is, we allow some variables at latent and only leave nodes are measured. And we allow the latent variables forming a hierarchical graph structure to generate the measured variables, which means that the children of latent variables may still be latent beyond the measurement model. And moreover, each variable can have multiple parents and there can be multiple passes between every pair of variables, that is beyond the tree structure. So given only the measured variables X, we aim to answer the following, three, uh, following two questions. First, how can we locate the hierarchical latent variables, or in other words, clustering the lower level variables? For instance, here, X1, X2, and X3 are in the same cluster with latent cover R6. And then the second question is, how can we identify the causal structure among the latent variables? The basic idea for learning latent hierarchical graph is as follows. We make use of rank deficiency constraints over measured variables, together with certain search procedure to identify the until causal graph. Specifically, if the rank of the cross covariance matrix over two sets, Xa and Xb, is deficient, then it tells us the smallest number of variables that de-separate Xa from Xb. And notice that different from the tetrad condition, which only considers two times two submetrics, submetrics. Here, we consider any size submetrics, which thus can handle more general latent cost graphs. For example, in this graph, let Xa be a set that contains X10 and X11, and Xb contains the remaining uh, measured variables. In this case, the rank of the cross covariance matrix over Xa and Xb is one, which is rank deficient. Because, uh, because R6 with dimension one de-separates uh, Xa from Xb. However, note that it doesn't directly tell us the location of the latent variables in the graphs with rank deficiency. So the rank deficiency test should be combined with certain such procedures in order to identify the whole causal graph. The search procedure contains three steps and outputs a mark of equivalence class of the entire graph. Specifically, the first step Find causal clusters aims to find clusters and assign latent covers, that is latent parents, in a greedy and recursive way by leveraging, uh, by testing rank deficiency over the measured variables. Let's take this ground truth graph as an illustration of the search procedure. With the measured data from, uh, with the input data from measured variables X, the first step starts from the measured variables to form clusters and add latent covers above them in a greater way when rank deficiency is found. For instance, that Xa be a set that contains, uh, contains measured variables X5, 6, 7, and 8, and Xb contains the remaining measured variables. In this case, the rank of the cross covariance matrix of Xa and Xb is two, which is rank deficiency, rank, uh, which is rank deficient. So we add a latent cover R6 and R7 with size two above Xa. And similarly, we add the latent cover R8, R9 above X9, 10, and 11, and add the latent cover R4 and R5 above X1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and next we form clusters over the current root variables and add the corresponding latent covers. Here, we can use the measured descendants as surrogate variables to test the rank deficiency instead of estimating the latent variables. For instance, 
let A be a set that contains L4 and L5. And so we use the measured descendants of A as a surrogate for rank tests. Here, in this currently estimated graph, the measured pure descendants of XA is uh, X1234. So in this case, the rank over XA and XB is one, which is rank deficient. So we add a latent cover L2 with size one above L4 and L5. Similarly, let XA contains L6 Air, Air and L7. So we can find rank deficiency. And then uh, we, can, we can add the latent cover L3 with size one above L6 and L7. So this procedure is repeated until no more clusters can be found. Finally, we connect the root latent covers into into one causal graph. However, notice that the first step may end up with incorrect clusters due to the grid search. So the second step aims to characterize and refine the incorrect clusters from grid search. For instance, in this example, the pink area from the first step has incorrect clusters due to the grid search in step one. Well, it first found rank deficiency over X9, X10, and X11 to form a cluster. But actually in the ground truth graph, X11 should form a cluster with L6 and L7. <clears throat> so these incorrect clusters can be, can be characterized by checking whether the graph will be split into disconnected subgraphs after removing the corresponding latent variables and its parents. For instance, here, if we remove L8 and L9 and their ages, the estimated graph will be split into three disconnected subgraphs. So we can conclude that uh, this cluster is incorrect. So the same step, first refine L2 by removing air two and its parents air eight and air nine, and then perform fine causal clusters over the current root variables. Rank deficiency can be found when testing for X11 and air six, oh, and air three. So we add a latent cover air 10 over above uh, X11 and air three. And next, we further perform fine causal clusters over the current root variables, L4, L5, uh, L10, and X9, 10, 11. And with the found rank deficiency, we add the latent cover L11 over X10 and L10. This procedure is repeated until no more clusters are found. And next, we refine L3 by removing L3 and its parents, L10, and perform cl find clusters over the current root variables. And then we can find a uh, latent cover L13 above X11 and L11. And finally, we connect the root latent covers. With the first two steps, we can correctly find the clusters and the corresponding latent covers. However, the previous two steps didn't consider the rank constraints across different clusters. So some ages may not be correct. So the third step further refines the ages among latent covers and find the v-structures by considering rank constraints across different clusters. In this example, in the third step, we refine the ages among latent variables and output a bark of equivalence class over the, over the until graph. For step three, we give another example that contains these structures to illustrate the search and test procedure. The left graph here is an output from step two. And notice that the first two, two steps didn't consider the de-separation uh, between L2 and L3. And therefore, the ages among L2, 
air air one, air two, air three, and air four may not be correct, including the V structure here. In particular, in the true graph, air one deseparates air two from air three, but air one and air four doesn't deseparate air two from air three. But these separations are not reflected in this in the discovered graph in from the first two steps because course uh course cover rank tests were not considered. Therefore, we need to refine the ages in the third step. To this end, we first set air one, air two, and air three, and uh, air uh, air four, air two, and air three to be fully connected by connecting air two and air three. And that uh, then we let A be a set that contains air two and x one, and the B be a set that contains air three and x two. So A contains air two and uh, x one, and B contains air three and uh, x B. Which means that we partition the children of air one into the two sets and uh, put them in A and B respectively. By doing so, we force air one to be in the separating set. Since the rank over the cross, cross, cross covariance matrix of A and B is one, which is rank deficient, it implies that no other variables in the separating set. So we can conclude that air one deseparates uh, air two from air three. So we can remove the age between air two and, and air three, and the directions between um, air one, air two, and between that between air one and, and air three cannot be determined. So we add the add an undirected ages between air one and air two, and between air one and air three. Now, since uh, since air two for three forms an unshared triplet, we want to test if a collider exists at air four. So to this end, let a let a one be a set that contains air two, air four, and x one, and b be a set that contains air three and x two. And so the rank over the cross covariance matrix of X A1 and B1 is two, which is larger than the rank over A and B, where A and B doesn't include air four. Recall that A is a set that contains air two and X1, B is a set that contains air three and X2, which doesn't uh, contain air four. And similarly, uh, Let's uh, let A2 con uh, be a set that contains air two and X1, and the B S B B S B2 be a set that contains air three, air four, and X2. And we find that the rank uh, the rank over A2 and B2 is two, which is also larger than the rank over A and B, where A and B doesn't contains uh, doesn't contain air four. So we can conclude that. By, uh, by doing such tests, we can conclude that air two, four, three forms the V structure. So finally, we output the mark frequency class of the NTL graph. So in causal discovery, now we have a rough idea about the NTL procedure of the algorithm. In causal discovery, we care about the theoretical identifiability. To achieve structural identifiability, the main assumption is that uh, the main assumption here is that for each latent variable set air with size k, it should have at least k plus one pure children, which can be either latent or measured, and and another k plus one neighbors of the latent variable set air. Here. V are pure children um, of latent variables here. Uh, if we don't have uh, other parents besides air, then we said V is we are pure children of latent variables air. For instance, in this example, for the latent variable set that contains air two and air three, it has uh, three pure children. Let's see, air six, air seven, and air eight, 
and also it has uh, another three three more neighbors. Let's see, air one, air uh, air ten, and uh, air air yeah air one. So we applied the poor post algorithm to synthetic, synthetic data to learn the latent hierarchical causal graphs. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first algorithm that can identify such general latent hierarchical structures. So to fairly compare with other methods, besides general hierarchical graphs that satisfy our condition, which, I, which is denoted by IR to H here, in reducible linear latent hierarchical graphs. We also consider the tree structures and the measured variables, measured, uh, measured models. And we also consider different metrics to evaluate the performance, performance including metric one that evaluates the, the recovered cluster over measured variables alone. And the metric, metric two evaluates the recovered cluster over all the variables. For both metrics, the higher, the better. Note that here, uh, even a single misclass a misclustered variable will output an error. So these metrics are rather strict. We compared with FOFC and the gene, uh, the gene methods. Well, FOFC is designed for one factor measurement model and the gene leverages high order statistics to identify the latent variable graph. It's obvious that our proposed methods has the best performance for general graphs and as well as for tree structures. And for one factor measurement model, our method outperforms FOFC when the sample size is relatively small. And when the sample size is uh, 10,000, both methods can well recover the graph. Now let's make a Brief summary of this method. Overall, the proposed approach works for latent hierarchical, uh, latent hierarchical structure discovery with linear causal relationships. And for each latent variable set with size k, it requires at least k plus one pure children. And moreover, it allows that for each variable, there can be multiple latent parents. However, we find that rank constraints alone may not be enough for more general latent graphs. For example, for these two graphs, they are differ in this uh, in the part differ in the parts in the middle, where the right uh, where the right graph has uh, has a triangle in the middle. These two graphs share the same rank constraints, so they cannot be distinguished with rank constraints alone. And moreover, let's see the two graphs in the right part. Uh, for these two graphs, we can see uh, this graph uh, has a, a direct causal ages among the measured variables. However, these two graphs also share the same rank, uh, rank constraints, which means that they are rank equivalent. So they cannot be uh, distinguished with rank constraints alone. So, it's necessary to extending the, the current approaches to allow weaker constraints on hierarchical structures. For example, we can uh, let me, by make, uh, for example, by making using of high order statistics, statistics or by making using of distribution shifts. At the, and uh, at the same time, we also consider to extend it to cover both continuous and discrete data types. And moreover, uh, we were extending it to allow nonlinear causal relationships and allow the input to be high dimensional images, which is related to the causal representation learning. And for the development of latent causal structure discovery, they are expected to apply to many real world scenarios. For instance, with the measured voxel data from fMI recordings, we would like to automatically identify and hierarchically cluster the underlying brain regions and discover the information flow from the measured voxel data. And currently, uh, and moreover, um, and currently for the, the functional brain regions are usually predefined uh, with some, 
with some prior knowledge. And another application is to identify the gene regulation process from the gene expression data. And we are going to collaborate it uh, with, uh, with a group from U University of Pittsburgh. Okay, uh, yeah, this work was done when I was from CMU and I just uh, moved from CMU to UCSD and study my causality group. And if you are interested in causality, causality related research, welcome to contact me. Also, I would like to say thank you to my uh, sister, uh, to my supervisors and the collaborators. Thank you very much for your attention. And I see some questions from Q and A. Maybe I can. Um, yes, I think we have one or two questions. One in Q and A, and I think one in the chat. Uh, yes, uh, we got a question from uh, Richard Berg. Uh, he asks about uh, whether there is. Uh, whether the identified structure is unique or not? Uh, yes. So under our conditions, the structure can be uniquely identified. I see. So basically, yeah, we need this, uh, these assumptions. For each latent variable set here with size k, it should, has, uh, it should have at least k plus one pure children, which can be either latent or measured and they should have another k plus one neighbors. Uh, so uh, the if basis, this condition, yeah. uh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, sure. If the condition holds, then we can uniquely identify the graph with rank constraints. Yeah, so uh, the, if this, the, uh -huh. please, yeah. sorry. Yeah, I was just wondering if this condition is violated, would you return a like set of potential structures? That's a very good question. So, um, for example, here, for this graph, we say uh, we can see that this graph violates our condition. And uh, if it has a, an, a rank equivalent graph, which, um, which satisfy our condition, then our algorithm will return that graph, return the graph in the, uh, on the left. Uh, the Thank reason, so, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the intuitive idea to have the K plus one children and the K plus one neighbors is we want to find the rank deficiency in order to um, add the latent covers above the variables. Thanks for your answer. Uh, we also get a bunch of questions in the Q&A. Um, the first one is asking whether there will be any problem of pairwise comparison in this procedure. Um, sorry, can you repeat it, uh, the question again? Um, it asks whether there is a problem of pairwise comparisons in this procedure. Mm. Actually, I'm not clear what is pairwise comparison. So uh, that means that um, do the rank def uh, rank deficient test the rank deficiency over the over sets of variables? Actually, I'm not sure either. So perhaps I'm also not sure, but it could mean like a multiple testing problem, maybe that you test some rank deficiency ah. somewhere and oh. then it kind of errors propagate. Well, I'm I'm not 100 percent I maybe. see, I see. Yes, I, I think in this problem still uh, there's there are still such problems when we use uh, the test, we use statistical tests to find a structure similar to the constraint based method. Thanks for your answer. Um, the next question asks about the computational aspect. Uh, the uh, participant asks, how scalable is this approach? Up to how many measured nodes were your tests and how deep were the trees? Are there any theoretical constraints for this? That's a very good question. So uh, currently, uh, I believe the algorithm can be used uh, to like to, to systems with less than uh, 100 variables. And uh, yeah, in the future, we will definitely go into uh, like, um, to make the algorithm um, can handle large scale problems as well. For example, 
by use uh, by parallelizing the rank tests and uh, mm, yeah yes uh, yeah thank you for the answer um one last question we have is about uh, is the number of latent variables predefined or estimated in a data driven manner yeah that's a very good question so um the number of variables are estimated in a data driven manner so they can be determined according to the rank if the if it's rank deficient i see um thank you for your all the answers uh, we currently do not have any more questions so i think we can proceed to uh, the discussion oh i think there's another question oh, right. oh yeah. yeah 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 just pops up one so yeah on yeah. slide 35 why is l8 a pure child and l9 a neighbor how are l8 and l9 different are they both trojans of like l2 and l3 yeah, so so this is a graph, I think. Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, uh, we can arbitrarily decide the pure children and the neighbors here. Air six, air seven, air nine, air uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten are all are pure children of uh, of this set, air two and air three. And the air one is the uh, is the neighbor. So we just uh, want, uh, in order to uh, explain this uh, this theoretical condition, I just uh, split these uh, pure variables into um, three into k plus one pure children and put other variables in the in the neighbors in order to explain that there should be k plus one children and k plus one neighbors. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, so I think we have no questions now. Uh, I think we can switch to the discussion by Eric. Yeah, thank you, Ying. Well, <clears throat> thanks for the talk, Biwei. Um, I've been really interested in the, uh, the work that your whole group has been doing using uh, brain constraints and similar things to look at these late variable um, types of models. Um, I think it's really interesting work and there's a, clearly a lot more to do and to, to continue to expand and, and push it further, um, especially you know, the brain constraints. And I know there's some combinations with brain constraints plus the, the, the GIN or GIN fame framework uh, as well. Um, you know, the, the, this project in particular is deploying them really flexibly in some interesting ways. I think incorporating the latent variables into the brain constraint sets is not something I've really seen a lot or seen explored. Um, um, I guess I don't have it here, but after watching your talk, I've sort of revised my own question to things I'd like to discuss. That's one thing I'd be curious about since I know that, you know, the covariances of the uh, latents with the measures are things that can be estimated from the measurement model. So you're doing like an iterative back and forth process, it seems like, because you need your measurement model to estimate those covariances that the latent variables have. And then you're using that information to do more rank constraints and going back and forth. So I think that's a really cool idea. Um, and obviously it's very, very powerful here. Um, and you know, I'm not aware of any other things that are looking at larger classes of model structures with, you know, deep layers of latent variables in a, in a causal theory driven way. So I think it's really excellent. Um, and there's also, I, was, I thought that a lot of the theory in the paper was very cool. It's obviously too much to talk about uh, in the short time that we have here. Uh, but I thought that that a lot of the content there will probably be really useful for the field in general going forward. Um, so as you already know, we, we talked about this. Um, I had some questions that I let you know ahead of time. Um, someone had already sort of asked this question. <laughs> so I don't know if we, we need to, to go into again, um, I guess I'll, I'll mention, um, especially considering some of the applications that were noted in your talk um, as areas that you'd like to go into, you know, just like fMRI data, um, you know, specifically like voxel level fMRI data. A lot of these are very high. Well, not, you know, it's all relative. Some people would, would not consider them big problems probably, but um, in terms of what causal discovery and usually does, these would be considered pretty big problems, right, with thousands of variables. Um, so uh, do you think the current um, 
the, the the algorithm as it's sketched out, you know, currently um, either implemented or you know, in terms of maybe it could be developed more than implementation, um, will work for in those kinds of settings. Um, yeah, it's just a, a question for you. Yeah, thank you. Shall I, shall I answer it now? Yeah. So yeah, I think yeah, you, you really get a point. It's uh, for the current implementation. Um, uh, they are, it's not very friendly for the uh, large scale problems. And uh, yeah, from, uh, I think it can cover like 100 measure variables, less than 100 uh, var var uh, measure variables. And uh, yeah, definitely it's it's a first version of the latent hierarchical structure discovery algorithm. So uh, so we care more, uh, we care more about the minor identifiability conditions and the correctness. So, and in the future, we will definitely um, spend time on speeding up the, the current implementation so that it can handle large scale problems. As you mentioned, if we want to handle like some real world problems such as the FMI data and the, the genetic data, definitely we need uh, this issue is need to be solved. Um, so in this algorithm, most of the time is spent on rank deficiency tests. So essential factors to improve the speed is to improve the rank deficiency tests and uh, paralyze the, the rank tests. Cool. Yeah, yeah that's the sort one of thing I was thinking about how it worked. It seems like since you're doing so many rank deficiency tests at each step, even though there is a, a sequence of steps, each of those steps, it seems like you're doing so many tests right those could probably all be farmed out right so that, yeah yeah so that would be i'd be really interested to see how well it scales up once once that's done and you upload it onto uh you know some sort of supercomputing architecture or something like that i'd be i'd be interested to see how well it scales because i think some yeah. of these yeah. have the promise to scale better than i think many of us think they, they do yeah uh, exactly and actually i think uh, for this parallelization, it, it may be similar to the parallelization of like the PC algorithm, which tests for the conditional independence. Yeah, 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 because it's similar. Yeah, you're doing all these tests at each step, exactly, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the FGES kind of does the same thing for speeding up GES, right? Just we're gonna score a whole ton of things, we can parallelize that and get really fast, right? Uh, yes, exactly. Sequential. Yeah. Um, um, and then my second sort of area that I was thinking about was with regarding to sample size. So the, the simulation results that you, that you showed, um, uh, obviously your, uh, your method was doing amazing. Uh, our other methods were looking not as amazing. <laughs> I'm glad that FOFC at least was correct in the area it's supposed to be correct in eventually. <laughs> um, um, I was wondering that why at the, even at the, at the, the lowest sample size you looked at was 2000. Um, in my own poking about when I was doing FOC and FTFC and those things, um, you know, often I, it seemed like we were able to get pretty good performance at like sample size 100 and 200, not probably not for FTFC because the the bigger rank constraints aren't as powered, right, um, at, at, at for lower samples. But um, I was wondering why even at sample size 2000, um, the performance of these things was pretty far from amazing. Um, is it do you, do you think that's something to do with how the simulation the models were set up or these like weak edges or something about the size or complexity yeah do you, do you have any insight about that ah i see that's a very good question you you read so carefully so yeah i think uh one possible uh reason is that uh the the noise variance is maybe larger than those in your experiments and you know that uh here, uh, we need to estimate the co co uh, co covariance metrics in order to uh, do the rank tests above them. So uh, if the, if the, uh, like the, the, uh, the strength is weak and the, the noise variance is large, it may affect the estimation of the co co covariance metrics. And uh, we also uh, use uh, Oracle covariance metrics to test the algorithm and it's, it uh, works very. It works very well when using Oracle covariance metrics. Cool. Because it's another thing. Yeah, I imagine probably in um, 
you know, an fMRI data and stuff like that, the, sometimes you can get pretty big samples, but not always, right? So yeah, the question, what, what, what's the effect size of those, of the actual edges in that data, right? So uh, I'd expect that it could still work in that domain, um, assuming scalability is resolved, even if, even if you don't have that, even if you don't have 10,000 samples, right? It seemed like yeah, yeah, your simulations are pretty hard for, for all the algorithms to learn. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, and then another question, which was, um, since I didn't really, I think, so these kinds of models, I think are violating the condition you've set up with, with, um, yes. with the neighbors and children, right? So I, I know that, I know that a friend is already going on. So, uh, I, this isn't a, I'm not trying to attack the, 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 the theorems, which are proven, right? But, um, you know, I'm just curious how, how does this, this approach you know, what does it return if you, or if you know, or have any intuition, what does it do with these kinds of weird models, right? So, right, you, there's like spider models, and there's a whole bunch of these other things that produce the same um, rank constraints, right, um, as, as these sort of latent hierarchical models and measurement models and those kinds of more desirable or more plausible, the kinds of models that we are looking for in the world. Um, but yeah, so I'm curious, you know, what's your thoughts on, you know, th these kinds of models, I guess, um, is, is, yeah, like, well, what would your algorithm do with it? it are, are rank, is this part of the thing where you think rank constraints just aren't enough, um, right? To, to, do you think it's like that? And we need to get into, you know, um, non-linearities, non-Gaussian noise, you know, additive noise model, whatever, you know, other kinds of higher order statistics, or, or, or do you have other thoughts? I'm just curious your impression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very good question. Yeah. So currently, I think in causal discovery, we usually care about like under if the assumptions are correct, what we can get. But we usually ignore like what if the assumptions down the hold what we will derive, right? right? So yeah, I think it's definitely important to consider this uh, these questions. So uh, for example, uh, uh, as you said, like uh, in our paper, we currently we don't allow like these triangles and, or the spider models. Uh, if there, um, so in, if, if the graph is like this, if there exists, uh, um, if there exists a graph that is rank equivalent to this graph and satisfy our condition, then our algorithm will return the rank equivalent graph to this graph. But if there's, it, there, if there doesn't exist such one, then yeah, it will yeah, just output some wrong graphs depending on the rank constraints. And uh, yeah, as I said that uh, there are so several assumptions in the current algorithm like linear, linear assumptions, like uh, the structure, structure constraints. And uh, you said what will happen if the cost relations are nonlinear? And if the noise, uh, if the noise terms are non-Gaussian, that's, that's I think there are problems we are going to uh, we are going to handle in the near future. Yeah, and no, uh, I think, yeah. yeah, sorry, and uh, yeah, actually, def, uh, actually, uh, I think that we think that with, for example, with non-Gaussianity and. Um, we can uh, non gaussianity allows us to handle more general graphs, even those that uh, has direct edges among the measured variables. So we, uh, we uh, from uh, from our previous slides, we saw that um, there there are rank equivalent graphs, and if we only use rank deficiency tests, it's uh, it's not enough to identify more general cross graphs. So in the future, we need to consider. Um, more information, for example, high order statistics and the distribution uh, shifts in order to uh, identify more general graphs. Yeah, for, for something like fMRI as it's just another case area, that's one where there is non-Gaussianity present. Um, don't, depends on how the data is pre-processed, right? But if they don't like, you know, whiten it and go out of their way to process the heck out of it and force it to be Gaussian, there is non-Gaussian noise in there um, and that's been really useful, I know, in people doing, trying to do causal modeling in that domain, um, including myself. Um, using that information has been really, uh, really effective for fMRI data. So that would, so yeah. in particular, that extension would work for this kind of thing for, for fMRI as well. 
Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. In um, if for this model in particular, I'm 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 guessing you're going to get a uh, two latent variables cause all the measures uh, model because this is this is uh, ranked efficient at uh, at rank two, right? Um, yeah. This, yeah. Um, it's a, it's a weird, it's a weird one though. If, I don't know if it, in the, in the, in the, yeah, <laughs> the, if the, in the Trek separation, basically you put L1 on both sides, on both sides of the separating set, just L1 that separates everything. So it's kind of weird because it's a separating set of size two, but it's one variable that does it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You, you are an expert in track separation. Right, yeah. Right. <laughs> and in our current proof, we only use D separation. And uh, yeah, we need to extend it to track separation if we uh, consider these graphs. Yeah, no, it's really cool. They did all that with D separation without getting into track separation at all. And I thought that was, that was really interesting. Just going straight, just skipping it kind of going straight to rank constraints is very cool. Um, I'll stop sharing here. Um, I did have, I don't know how we're on time. I did actually have one more question that occurred to me over the course of the talk um, that I was curious about. Um, it was in one of your slides. So I don't have it here. Um, it was the, the one that a lot of people talked about. You had a nice big uh, latent hierarchical model. Um, and you mentioned that this was that, you know, this was identifiable. One thing I wasn't sure about is for, at least in terms of the rank constraints, I believe you can often flip one edge and get your model back. Um, like you and have the same rank constraints, right? So if I have a simple measurement model, right? One latent, for example, right? And has, I don't know, like 12 pure children or something like that. If I have one of those children cause the latent, I'll have the exact same rank constraints, right? Um, I see, yeah. So, and, and I, yeah. yeah. And I was wondering about, so I know that's kind of ruled out by the way you've defined your models. You've got, you know, only only latents can be parents of other things in your in your latent hierarchical model definition. But I was wondering if something like that would also happen at the level of the latents, though, right? If I have one latent, bunch of latents, they have their own children. Can I just flip one of these edges up here? Yes. Okay. Yes. Because our algorithm with rank rank constraints, we can only um, recover the graph up to the mark of equivalence class, which means that some directions cannot be determined. Okay, so like a final step in this somewhere would be reversion to a Markov equivalence class to produce yeah. your graph. Okay, I just wasn't yeah. sure about that. It's all in, the uh, it's in step right. three. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. All right, that's my that's my last uh, my last thing. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Eric, for the inspiring discussions. Yeah, there are a lot of work to do in the near future on this direction, I think. Awesome, thanks. It was very, very refreshing to see like an actual an interactive discussion. And I think we should encourage our speakers to do that and speakers and discussions to do that more often in the future. Um, I think there's one more question in Q&A currently that you might wanna take uh, the away. Um, I think it has already been touched on a little bit during the discussion, but maybe you want to comment on it quickly again. So how would identifiability conditions change in the presence of nonlinearity or non linearity of causal relationships? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> for non linearity the high order statistics can help us to handle more general graphs. That is, the identifiability condition can be milder, even milder. And for non gaussianity um, we need some, I believe we need some constraints on the functional causal model so that uh, we can have um, minor identifiability condition. If the function causal model uh, is, is arbitrary, then probably uh, it's the identifiability condition will be stronger. Awesome, thank you. So I currently don't see any additional questions. So I'll just uh, quickly uh, wrap up. So first of uh, all, well, yeah, thanks Liwei for a very nice talk and thanks Eric <clears throat> for a fantastic uh, discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, next week, we're gonna have Rahul Singh uh, and Jiaki Zhang. I hope I pronounced it correctly. So two students from uh, MIT who will uh, give two talks, one about causal inference with corrupt data, measurement error, missing values, discretization and differential privacy and another one about active learning from optimal intervention design in causal models. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I think it was a very fun, uh, very, very fun uh, seminar and I uh, hope to see you all uh, next week. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. <laughs>